Nomads Orthodox Presbyterian Church for our morning service in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, several announcements. Um, one, as you can probably hear, I'm recovering from a cold, so I will not be shaking hands, and we will also be canceling the adult um, Sunday school class today. Uh, next Sunday, um, my family and I will be on vacation uh, starting Tuesday, coming back Monday. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have Mr. Luke walk up in the pulpits, both for the morning and evening service. Uh, the Bible study will not meet this week, nor will the adult Sunday school class next Sunday morning. All the lower classes will still be meeting. Also, there's a thank you in the uh, bulletin from the Presbytery. Those are the words of Peter Bringy, <coughs> our stated clerk. Um, so, uh, some thanks there from the Presbytery. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present in our midst this morning. Please turn with me to number 305, Arise, my soul, and rise, 305.
come to Article 4 of the Third and Fourth Heads of Doctrine of the Canons of Dort. What about the light of nature? <clears throat> what does it do and what does it not do? The answer is that it gives everyone enough knowledge to render them without excuse. But it does not give them what they need for salvation. And in fact, what unredeemed humanity does with this knowledge is that it twists it and suppresses it. So it's not the case that somebody can simply live up to the light they have and get more light. Instead, they twist it and oppress it, as it were. That's our fault, by the way, that that light is not sufficient for us. It would have been sufficient had Adam and Eve not fallen in the garden. They would not have needed any other light of revelation, but they did not, and so it is insufficient. But God in his grace has given us the Bible, which is what we do need for salvation. So this contrasts, in, in effect, what we get by nature and what we get by scripture. There is, to be sure, a certain light of nature remaining in man after the fall, by virtue of which he retains some notions about God, natural things, and the difference between what is moral and immoral, and demonstrates a certain eagerness for virtue and for good outward behavior. But this light of nature is far from enabling man to come to a saving knowledge of God and conversion to him. <coughs> So far, in fact, that man does not use it rightly, even in matters of nature and society. Instead, in various ways, he completely distorts this light, whatever its precise character, and suppresses it in unrighteousness. In doing so, he renders himself without excuse before God. Please turn with me to number 308. It'll sing Jesus, paint it all, 308.
expository reading for the morning is Ruth chapter 4, which you can find on page 264 in the Church Bible. This is the, a wonderful ending to this story. Boaz talks to the closer kinsman redeemer, and as soon as the kinsman redeemer understands that he acquires Ruth along with the property, he gets cold feet. So then that leaves the way open for Boaz to confirm the redemption of Ruth. And so we see then the uh, first major instance of a Gentile coming into the people of God, being grafted in to the olive tree, as Paul would say it, of God's people. And this is, of course, the story of the lineage of King David. The genealogy at the end has Boaz in the seventh slot and David in the tenth slot. These spots were often the important slots in a genealogy. And so to make it plain, this is, you know, Gentiles are going to be in the genealogy, not only of David, but of course the greater David, our Lord Jesus Christ, later on. Which proves, of course, that the promises that God made to Abraham that he would be a blessing to the nations, are indeed coming to fruition. So this is Ruth chapter 4. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. He turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. They said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it, and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here, and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. He said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Kilion and to Mahlon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Mahlon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephratah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadav. Aminadav fathered Nachshon. Nachshon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Let's come before the Lord our God in prayer. O oh Lord God, you who are perfectly holy, 
righteous and just. We acknowledge before you your many perfections and praise you for them. We give you thanks for them. But we also, Father, acknowledge our sin before you this day. That we have sinned in what we have thought, what we have said, what we have done, and how we have omitted to do what you have commanded, how we have done what you have forbidden, how we have not had love in our hearts towards you and towards our neighbors. We confess before you that our sin is before us. We confess it before you, God, and ask that you forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the promises of Scripture that tell us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We give thanks to you for the redemption we have through Christ's blood. We praise you for the full forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of your grace which you have lavished upon us, that you have forgiven us all our iniquities, healed us from all our diseases, in love, you've delivered our souls from the pit of destruction. And so we lift up our testimony to your grace that has worked mightily in us, even to this day. For Father, you keep giving us the nourishment we need, not just what our bodies need, but what our souls need. And in the day when we cried out, you answered us, you enable us to stand firm, even with strength from yourself. Our Father, we thank you that you do not snuff out the smoldering wick, or snap off the splintered cane, but you are a God of grace, and you know our weaknesses, you know our frailty, and your grace is with us, and it enables us to stand. We thank you that you protect us from the attacks of the evil one, that you give us the armor that we can put on and bind together by prayer to fight off the temptations that come our way. We pray that your grace will work in us what we can do in resisting that temptation. We thank you for giving us a law which is no longer our judge in Jesus Christ, but that is now our guide. We thank you that we are no longer condemned, but can live a life of thanksgiving for the salvation you have accomplished. We thank you that you have given us reassurance of your love for us. We thank you that you have promised that even if we fall down many times, you will lift us back up. For you are our God, our rock and redeemer. We thank you, Father, for the sign that you've given to us of this in our baptisms. We thank you that it points us to the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We pray that you would remind us of this truth over and over again, so that we might rejoice in salvation, Flee to it, be constantly cleansed by it, and be attached to you, O Lord God. We pray, Father, that the, this message of forgiveness and cleansing will be the message of the church throughout the length and breadth of this land and in all other lands. But we pray, Father, for the promotion of the gospel in war-torn Ukraine and in Russia. We pray, Father, that you would be kind and gracious to the people there. We pray, Father, for your gospel to go forth unhindered in China, in the Middle East, in Muslim countries. We pray, Father, that you would bring revival to the United States that you would even start here, Lord, by your Holy Spirit's power, 
For we know that small beginnings are what you delight in, the greater glory to accrue to yourself. We pray, Father, for our church and its members. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask for healing for those who are ill. We ask for spiritual comfort and nourishment for those who are downcast. And we ask for comfort for those who mourn. And we ask, Father, whatever our requests might be for those loved ones that we have in mind, that you will hear us and answer us in your good time. We pray that our worship may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn to hymn number 551. We'll stand and sing, How Blessed Is He Who's Trespass. 551. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you as your people, the people of your pasture, to feed on your word and to feed on Christ by faith. We pray that you will sustain us and nourish us in our souls by the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray these things. Amen. I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 30. This is page 84 in the Church Bible. Well, looking at verses 17 through 21, and then at a single verse in chapter 38. And this is Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. The Lord said to Moses, We shall also make a basin of bronze, with its stand of bronze, for washing. We shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and we shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water, so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet, so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. And then chapter 38, verse 8. He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Medical doctors are rather well known for being obsessive compulsive about washing their hands. They do it many times per day and with good reason. With what we know about germs and viruses, bacteria and microorganisms is quite enough justification for this practice, especially in a hospital. We want our doctors to be obsessed with cleanliness because if they aren't, disease is waiting just around the corner. Hospitals need to be clean or else the hospital could do more damage than good. Well, in a similar way, the priests of the Old Testament were to be obsessed with ritual cleansing. They were the spiritual doctors of the people. They, too, needed to be clean. This basin was made for ritual cleansing, which had to happen every time the priest went to do something in the tabernacle or even when they came near the altar to offer the sacrifices. It pointed to the priest's need to be cleansed by the blood of a Savior. It has the same message for us, and it tells us about two cleansings that we receive, both of which are symbolized and sealed by baptism, a once-for-all cleansing, and a continual cleansing. This is a life-or-death message for us as it was for the priests. It says if they did not wash in the water, they would die. Verses 20 and 21 both say this. If we are not washed with the blood of Christ, we will die eternally. It's repeated for emphasis. Cleansing <laughs> is a life-or-death matter. <coughs> Now this basin was located between the altar and the tabernacle, according to verse 18. Why not between the entrance and the altar? Why between the altar and the tabernacle? Well, the reason it is not located between the entrance and the altar is that it was not for the people to be cleansed. The people were cleansed by the blood of the animals on the altar. Although even there, it was only insofar as that blood looked forward to the blood of Christ being shed that it had any effect. The priests mediate between God and the people. That's why the basin is located between the tabernacle and the altar. The place where priests start is the place of cleansing. If they went into the tabernacle, they needed cleansing. If they went the other direction, to the altar, they needed cleansing. 
The priests were themselves sinners, weren't they? They needed cleansing in major ways, two major ways to be precise. They needed a once-for-all cleansing at the beginning of their ministry. And they needed constant everyday cleansing as well. We need this too, which is why this text is so very relevant to us. The first cleansing needed is the once-for-all cleansing at the beginning of their ministry. In chapter 29, when Aaron and his sons were consecrated for the ministry of priesthood, it all started with a ritual cleansing, as you can see in 29 verse 4. That symbolized the need for regeneration. Regeneration is a word that theologians use to describe the new birth, being born again, as Jesus puts it in John 3. Or as Ezekiel would say, we need our hearts of stone removed and hearts of flesh put in their place. We need a resurrection of a dead soul to new life, as Paul would put it in Ephesians 2. Whether you call it new birth, or regeneration, or the resurrection of the soul, it all means the same thing. New spiritual life. And the Holy Spirit is the one who accomplishes that. This great benefit to us. Jesus says it very clearly in John 3. Comparing the Holy Spirit to the wind. And especially the fact that you don't see the wind, you see what it does. So also you don't see the Holy Spirit, but you can certainly see what he does. We do not decide for Christ and therefore regenerate ourselves. The Holy Spirit moves in us before we react with faith. So this regeneration is related to our sin in the following way. The power of the guilt of our sin has to be washed away in regeneration. That's done by the blood of Christ. So the Holy Spirit applies that blood of Christ to our sin-stained soul and washes us clean through that blood of Jesus Christ. And the question for most for us is how do we know whether that has happened or not? Take the question of children, for example. It's easy to mistake the state of our children. And there's two main mistakes that we make. The first is to assume that they are not regenerated. Children can be regenerated before they are even born, as the example of John the Baptist proves to us. He leaped in the womb at the approach of his Savior. And David says to the Lord that he trusted in the Lord even when he was still nursing. Children can often never know a day when they don't know Jesus. In which case the Christian life for them looks like a continual nurturing and growing up in faith. If we then require some time-stamped date from them concerning a conversion, we will actually teach them to doubt what they already have. And that is not wise. But it is equally wise, unwise I should say, it is equally unwise to assume that our children are regenerated. Not all children are regenerated from the womb, as we well know. Some grow up into a state of rebellion. And sadly, just because parents are Christians doesn't mean their children are Christians. Yes, God very often works through the covenant continuity of families, but not always. The question of what we should do, however, fortunately, is the same in either case. Tell our children the gospel. Fortunately for us, the gospel is what Christians need, and it is what non-Christians need. They both need the same thing. So fortunately, we can tell them the good news while not making an assumption either way about the state of our children, at least not at the beginning. It is for the regenerate and the non-regenerate. And baptism preaches that same gospel, which is one of the main reasons we baptize our children. Baptism is a visible sermon that preaches the power of the blood of Christ to cleanse us once for all from our sin. It is a proof that God means what he says. 
It is a guarantee that if a person does put their faith in the Lord and Savior of sinners, Jesus Christ, they will be saved. We know that baptism itself does not regenerate a person. But it works in a very similar way to the Word of God. It just works through a different mode. See, the Word of God is preached to our ears. Baptism is preached to the eyes. The other senses. In baptism, you see what the water that represents Christ's blood in the word you hear about the blood of Jesus. Both baptism and the word preach the blood of Christ as cleansing us from sin. Regeneration cleanses us. And that's what Paul means in Titus 3.5, where he calls regeneration a washing. Many people mis misinterpret Titus 3, 5, the washing of regeneration, as a reference to baptism actually causing regeneration. But that's not what the text is saying there at all. It's talking about regeneration. And that regeneration is a form of washing. That's all it's saying. Regeneration washes us. So how do we know then? that we've been washed? How do we know that the Holy Spirit, that he has come into our lives and put new life into us? Well, the answer is threefold. The first is that God makes promises in the Holy Scripture about salvation, and that we believe those promises. So the Word gives us assurance of salvation. Secondly, there will be evidence of grace in our lives. We will see life, our life differently from the unbeliever. We will see history differently. There will be a mighty struggle in our lives with sin. The unbeliever doesn't have that struggle. So one great encouragement for the believer is that the actual presence of the struggle. And thirdly, the testimony of the Holy Spirit as he witnesses with our souls. Well, how do we lay hold of those ways of being assured of salvation? Well, we do that by using the means of grace. Grace is what gets us there. So we need the means of grace. What are the means of grace? The Word of God preached, the sacraments, and prayer. So we have seen then that baptism is of tremendous value to us as a visual preaching of the gospel. A seal of the promises of God, that God means what he says, that the blood of Christ really and truly cleanses us from sin once and for all. But you see, the beginning of the Christian life is not the only time of life for which baptism has value. Baptism can help us all the way through life. Yes, it's only administered once. But that doesn't mean that its effect is limited to that one time. We can see that from the text in verse 20. Whenever they go to the tent of meeting, whenever they come near the altar to minister, it says when they go, it means whenever. Implying that they would go many times to that basin. The washing was for them. It was there every time for them. And so also baptism is there for us all through our walk in life, not just at the beginning of the Christian walk. Martin Luther knew this truth well. Oftentimes when temptation came his way, he would respond by saying, I have been baptized. So by remembering that visual promise of water pointing to the blood of Christ, Luther would remember the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Remembering that we've been cleansed by Christ's blood is a very effective way to help us resist temptation. Christ's blood cleanses us from all our sin, past, present, and future. We must avoid two problems here. The first is to forget that Christ's blood cleanses us once for all, and thus be tempted to fall into despair. Our continuing sin does not cancel 
the cleansing of Christ's blood. Rather, Christ's blood cleansing us calls us back once more to repentance. The other error we need to avoid is to presume on that cleansing in order to say, since I've been cleansed from sin, it's now okay for me to plunge into that sin again. Well, the reason that is an error is because is precisely because Christ's blood cleanses us from the sin. If we've been cleansed, why would we want to get dirty again with that? That'd be like a medical doctor disinfecting himself before a major operation and then going to the pig pen and covering himself with filth. Doesn't make any sense. But then again, sin never does make sense, does it? It is completely irrational. So baptism has value all through life, not just when it is administered. Whenever we see someone baptized, we should remember our own baptisms and be strengthened by the promises of God to a renewed fight against sin. We should not only remember our own baptisms at the time of temptation, we can remind others of their baptism when they are tempted to sin. Doing so has been vividly described as grabbing them by their baptism. Baptized people have been set apart, set apart from the world. We need a reminder of that fact. So both of these cleansing aspects, the once for all cleansing and the continual cleansing, they all point us to our Savior Jesus. He was baptized too. Now isn't that odd? He had no sin that he needed to be cleansed of. Why was he baptized? You ever wondered that question? Why was Jesus baptized? Well, you know, Jesus says, because of course John the Baptist had the same question. He said, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? And Jesus said, suffer it to happen now to fulfill all righteousness. That's a very broad concept. Most theologians agree that Jesus' baptism means that he was identifying himself with his people. He was entering into their state so that he could bear their sins. Remember that baptism also has a judgment side to it. When you remember Noah's flood, which Peter calls a type of baptism, or the Red Sea, where Paul tells us it was a baptism into Moses. There is a judgment against sin that happens in both of those cases. In the New Testament, Jesus calls his own death a baptism. Remember when those disciples wanted to sit at God's right and left hand. He says, can you be baptized with the baptism I am going to be baptized with? He wasn't talking about the Jordan River. He was talking about his death. His death was a baptism. In what sense? In taking on the judgment for sin. He received the judgment so that we would not. He took on himself the judgment side of baptism so that we could receive the grace side. We receive grace, of course, for many reasons in God's good plan. One of them is so that we can serve others. In John 13, right before Jesus was betrayed into the hands of sinners, he took a basin, poured water into the basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet. Remember, the priests had to wash their feet as well as their hands. And that was a matter of life and death. And remember what Peter said? He said, I can't be baptized. I can't be washed by you. See, there, there's a resistance there in the human psyche 
to, to recognizing the need that we have to be washed. We don't want to think that of ourselves. I'm not that bad. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no portion in me. Here is Jesus showing us just how we have a portion in Christ. It's through being washed. And that that is an impetus for us to serve. This should be a big check on our normal view of church. All too often we think of church as the place where all we do is we receive. And if we don't receive what we want or what we expect, well, we're tempted to just move on. And our approach to church is then a bit on the selfish side when we think that way. But Jesus says it's the place where we serve one another. And because it's the result of our service to God. Worship is service to God. Remember in the Old Testament when Joshua says, choose you this day whom you shall serve. That word serve is the same word as worship. In other words, Joshua is saying, choose you this day whom you shall worship. Worship is service to God. We are serving him, serving in his glory, putting his glory on display for the world to see. And that continues outside worship, when we serve one another and sacrifice for one another. And this is how Jesus defines true greatness in the kingdom of God. It's measured by service. It's not measured by fame, by wealth, by church office, by knowledge, or anything else but service. The mark of who is great in the kingdom of God is service. It's not about what other people think about us. We shouldn't do service in order to be seen. We should serve because that serves the glory of God. It's such a hard truth to remember. It's a difficult goal. But by God's grace, we can make an improvement in that area. So like the medical doctor who constantly needs to disinfect his hands, the priests who constantly need cleansing, so also we constantly need cleansing, and this is provided abundantly in the blood of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives it to us once for all in regeneration, which is a washing of the soul. It continually applies it to us through the constant cleansing of the Word and of baptism. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not only cleanse us of our sin in Christ, but give us the means to be assured of it, to know that we have been, to know that there is always cleansing in Christ. It's always available for us and is more than sufficient to take out the worst spots in us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you know the worst about us love us anyway. Thank you that Christ's blood is just that powerful. We thank you that you have made us a kingdom of priests. That you wash us once for all and you also wash us every day. We pray that we will walk as servants who have been washed pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 307, Nothing But the Blood. We'll stand and sing 307.
power of Jesus' blood is the most wondrous, valuable thing that we can know. To know that it has been applied to us. And so, Father, make our hearts truly grateful for it, for salvation in Christ, for the cleansing power of his blood, so that these tithes and offerings will be our gratitude to you, not the only form, Father, but a tangible one. May you bless these tithes and offerings and expand them in your kingdom to your honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.